those of you joining us for the first time tonight, uh, my name is John Fields, and I am the Lydia Cheney and Jim Sokol Endowed Director of AVA. AVA is a visual arts center located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We present eight to 10 exhibitions a year, highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed artists focused almost exclusively on contemporary art. We serve a diverse audience of university faculty, staff, and students, artists, museum patrons, and donors. We help represent the visual arts at UAB to local and regional institutions, but also the national and international art community while simultaneously striving to keep our exhibitions directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. Um, since 2014, Ava has been featured in the New York Times, the Huffington Post, The Nation, Raw Vision Magazine, PBS Canvas, among others. And we are very proud that all of our exhibitions and related educational programming like tonight are free and open to the public. Um, we've been doing this, these weekly live events basically since the first week of the quarantine back in mid-March. Um, and tonight's guest is an artist who's joining us from Albion, Michigan, where he serves as professor of painting and drawing, as well as the chair for the Department of Art and Art, Her Art, the Department of Art, and Art History at Albion College. Um, so tonight, Michael Dixon will give us an overview of his career, which uses painting and performance to explore his own cultural duality and the experience of growing up biracial in America. Um, during Michael's presentation, we will mute everyone's microphone, um, but feel free to use the chat feature in Zoom to sort of comment or ask questions. And then once Michael's finished, we'll sort of open the floor up and swing back around to any uh, questions or comments that anyone might have. Um, Michael's work has been exhibited all over the world, including New York, including New York, um, Istanbul, uh, Sarajevo, just to name a few. His work resides in numerous public and private collections, including the Petrucci Family uh, Foundation Collection of African American Art in Asbury, New Jersey, the Benson Collection at the University of Texas at Austin, and something we were talking about before um, before we hopped on this event. Uh, his work is actually in the personal private collection of artist Nick Cave, which I think is probably the coolest thing I've heard all day. Um, his work has been featured in publications such as New American Paintings. And in 2015, Michael was the recipient of the Pollock Krasner Foundation Grant, and in 2019, a Joan Mitchell Center residency. Um, and so I met Michael through photographer Carolyn Shearer, and for the past year or so, he and I have been working um, on an exhibition that will examine the use of blackface in contemporary art. And so Michael is one of several artists that will be included in this exhibition, which Ava hopes to present sometime in the next couple of years. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Michael Dixon. Thank you, John. Uh, I just want to, before we get started, I really want to thank uh, Carolyn Shearer, who I met uh, at Penland. I teach, I teach workshops at Penland from time to time. And, and this last summer, uh, last year, actually, Carolyn was in one of my painting workshops. And she was like, you have to come to Birmingham. You know, you must come to Birmingham. And so she brought me to Birmingham and was just so supportive and nice. And introduced me to John and John's been great. And then I, I, so I just want to thank Carolyn and, and John and Tina and Amanda. And I've been um, tuning into these events and it's been nice to, you know, you have a really nice art community in Birmingham and it's been really nice to kind of stick my toe, my big toe in the water of Birmingham and uh, be a part of that a little bit. So just big shout outs to those people. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here. And all right, I think we got this. All right, so those are my thank yous. Um, and so essentially what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and my personal narrative. Um, I'll get a little bit into my influences and then we'll look at just a quick overview of my work. And it's, it's about the, roughly the last 10 years or so of what I've been working on. And so I, I grew up in San Diego, California. This is my mother, Peggy Rumpf. She's now Peggy Schendel. My mother's white. Uh, this is my biological father, Michael Jackson. He's a Michael Jackson, not the Michael Jackson. And, uh, and I didn't know my father growing up. And so uh, my mother had me when she was 19. And so um, this is Joe Dixon, who 
my mother married when I was about two or three. So this is who I called dad. And uh, they divorced when I was about six or seven. And so where I grew up in San Diego was very diverse. And, um, you know, a lot of mixed kids, a lot of black kids, white kids, Mexican kids. And, and it was one of my cousins, again, when I was about six or seven, I like this picture because it shows me painting and I'm a painter. And so this is like an elite painting school when I was a kid, but it's, it's my aunt's daycare. And, uh, and so this is my, my bunch of cousins that I grew up with. So my eldest cousin, uh, Debbie is on the top left there. Uh, she was the one, uh, her and her brother were eating purple popsicles. Me and my sister were eating red popsicles. And I said, ah, oh, you guys are, are black. And me and my sister are, are Indians, you know, and, uh, again, associating color with race at a young age, it's a different talk for a different time. But, uh, my cousin Debbie said, well, Michael, you're black. And I was like, no, I'm not. She's like, yeah, you are. And I was like, no, I'm not. And so then I ran to my mother and I, I said, Debbie said I was black. And then my mother looked down and said, well, you are black, Michael. And, and uh, that's how I found out I was half black. And so it was this kind of thing that happened, this event. And, it was really never talked about again. And so when I think about identity, I think about how we self-identify and how, how the world perceives our identity. So when I was a kid, you know, uh, in the 80s, they started doing those standardized tests and they, you would have to put your race and I'd be very confused and I would put white. And so I would say as a kid, I, I self-identified as white. In high school, we moved out of San Diego to a place called Yucca Valley, which is in the high desert of California. It's a very white space, Joshua Tree, 29 Palms, high desert. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to worry about, you know, my, my racial identity. I'm just going to be Michael. And my dating pool was white women. And at this point was when I first really started uh, experiencing direct racism. You know, parents and grandparents would find out I was black and they wouldn't like me dating their white daughter or granddaughter. And uh, my friends were kind of these kind of rednecky white friends. And, uh, and I was kind of the token black friend. And so it really wasn't until college that I, I took a African-American history class my first semester of college and really started to form a black identity through reading about history and learning about um, African-American history. And so how I self-identify has shifted throughout my life. And, you know, I'm, I'm a light-skinned biracial black man. And so hair, my hair um, changes a lot. And so depending on how my hair is and the context in which I find myself, people see my identity in lots of different ways. And so pretty much any kind of mocha latte ethnicity I've been uh, asked if I was that. And so my artwork is really um, kind of trying to define that space of not quite being white enough, not quite being black enough. And really it's, it's been through racism that I, I've been told that I'm not white enough. And because my family unit was white growing up, culturally i don't feel black enough and so that's that kind of space that i'm really trying to capture in my work um i was in undergrad in the kind of the mid to late 90s and so identity work was really uh kind of hot at that that point and so um a lot of the artists that really influenced me at that time were artists that were dealing with identity politics so this is robert cole scott light-skinned black man and he would call, you know, the way he painted was very cartoony, but the content was very uh, tough content. And so he would call that his one-two punch. People would come into the work because it looked kind of benign. And then they would, they would kind of look at the content and then they'd be like, oh, and they'd be very surprised by the content. Uh, Kerry James Marshall, another artist that was really influential. Uh, he's kind of exploded. Uh, his career has exploded since the 90s. But... Uh, influential artist for me, Michael Ray Charles, another uh, artist that was very influential at this time in my life, Faith Ringgold, 
And this is uh, this is a flag series she did in the kind of the '60s and '70s, uh, and it says "Die in Word" in the, in the flag, very controversial. And so, a lot of these artists, um, a lot of those artists were very controversial, even in the in the '90s, and, and they were really pushing buttons. Um, and I really like that about their work. Francis Bacon, another artist that I really uh, is really influential in my work, and I really respond to the kind of psychological aspect of his work. Um, and then Beverly McKeever uh, is an artist. She teaches at Duke currently, but she was, she was my undergraduate faculty member at Arizona State. And she was the only black faculty. I was the only black student in the art department. And uh, so I, I begged her to be my friend and she became my friend. <laughs> and so those are just some of my early influences. Um, and I'll kind of go through my work, like I said, some of the iconography that, that I use, my work is very much influenced by my personal narrative. Um, I, I use a lot of history in my work. And so I'm thinking I, I will often kind of blackface and whiteface kind of cycle through my work. Um, and I'm, the, the blackface is really used because I've experienced my blackness really through a racist lens, be having racism or being the on the other end of racism, um, the receiver of racist acts. And so that's when I felt the most black. So blackface for me or, or kind of this Sambo imagery really speaks to that. And then I've used whiteface to be like, am I white enough? Uh, and the way I make my work is usually through a performance. All of my work, is performative based, and then I make paintings from these performances. So this is uh, Sambo scratches his navel and watches his crazy sister. And this is, um, this is Onye Azuzu. Onye Azuzu is the dean of the dance college in, at the University of Florida in Gainesville currently. I met her at CU Boulder where I did my graduate work. And so she was, um, she was doing some performance work where she was using the colors of Sambo in, in these performances. So we collaborated on this work. Um, and so she came in and performed in front of my house in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, from those images, I made these paintings and then we proceeded to show this work um, in, ser in several kind of art spaces, galleries, museums. And so it would be the work and then she would perform with the work in the gallery space. And so it, it, the paintings were this kind of evidence of this performance and then the performance would happen uh, with the work. And then all the evidence of the performance would stay in the gallery space. And so she was, you know, it was kind of a riff off, you know, Sambo is a, is kind of an American thing and Alegua is an Afro-Caribbean deity who, whose colors are the same as uh, Sambo's. And so it's this becomes this metaphor about white culture, black culture, and how those things collide. Uh, the Beautiful Struggle. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I, uh, I don't know my biological father. And so I decided I was going to uh, find him. And so... I decided to, to paint these self-portraits about how I was feeling about this person before I met him, be, knowing that I would be different on the other side of that journey. And so I made these 20 self-portraits, again, kind of checking in with how I was feeling about this person who I'd never met. Titles have always been important in my work. I, uh, I usually, the titles uh, help with the context. Um, and so I did these self-portraits and then I chickened out. I didn't, I didn't find my father. <laughs> and I, I like the idea of making work about it, but uh, at, the, at the end of the day, I, I, uh, I couldn't go through with it. Um, and so that's still on my, my plate. And uh, I, think I, I think I'm getting to the point where I'm, I'm building up the courage again to actually do that and find him. Uh, my black flesh and white flesh don't get along. And, and these, are all, these are all bodies of work. I typically work in these kind of uh, thoughts or bodies. They're, they usually are about 20 plus paintings. And um, 
typically how I move through these ideas. And so each one of these is, is a body of work. Uh, and so again, these are kind of small, uh, full body self portraits and kind of closer self portraits or kind of big head self portraits. And again, just thinking about not, you know, these are really about not being comfortable in my own skin and, and what it, you know, again, trying to capture that, that feeling or emotion of, of not quite fitting in. Um, and so a lot of these are that, dealing with that. Shared histories. Uh, so in 2011, I, uh, well, I have a friend. And so in 2011, I went to Turkey for the summer. I lived in Turkey. And I have a friend of mine, her name's Rashida, who's African American. And she, she married a Turkish guy and has a, a bicultural, uh, biracial son. And so she knew my work and she asked me, do you want to come live in Turkey <laughs> and do a project here? And I was like, yes. Yes, I do. And so there's black people in Turkey and there's black people all over the Middle East. And there's, there was a slave trade during the Ottoman Empire. And so um, there's lots of mixing and lots of biracial kids and families all over the Middle East. And so I, I interviewed people uh, who had one black parent, one white parent, and I talked to them about how they self-identify and how their communities identify them and so and then I painted their portrait and this this ultimately will become a larger uh, and it, it kind of it's a growing project so I want to do this kind of all over the world and I've started painting some some portraits here in the in the US uh, because whenever I meet someone who's biracial I always they, we always have that conversation like how do you identify this and then you know tell me a story and those stories are my stories and so and so I'm, again, I'm looking for that, that unique space, those unique experiences that describe being biracial and, and how does, how does, is that shared internationally? Is there like an international language, you know, of, of being mixed race and trying to fit in? And so that's kind of what I'm looking for. Uh, this is the last, uh, this is the, I have the work that I'm going to end with, this is the body of work right before that. And so the more things change, the more they stay the same. And this, I was, um, I was at, I won an award. It was called the Sharp Walenta Studio Program. And it's a, it's a one year studio in New York. And so I was on sabbatical and, um, and I won this award to go live in New York for the year. And I wasn't really planning on, doing this work, but this was right about the time when shootings were happening and about every other day or every night, there was a, a dead black person that had been shot and killed by police. Um, and so this work is really about that kind of violence and, and, you know, how I felt about that and kind of processing that. And, um, and so at the time, I was reading a, I was reading a, lots of stuff about black around black political thought, and so it's the it's a lot of these old speeches that uh, you know Frederick Douglass gave and W. Du Bois and a lot of these old speeches that you know are late 1800s into you know the 60s and 70s, and so it was really what struck me about these speeches and a lot of, I pulled, not all of these titles, but a lot of the titles come out of those, some of those speeches, but uh, say a speech by Frederick Douglass, you know, that was given in the late 1800s. A lot of those, a lot of the language and the, the things he's talking about could be, it could be a speech that was given today and it would still be relevant. And so that really uh, was very poignant to me as I was reading these, these things. And so this idea of the more things change, the more they stay the same. And, and so the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, she talks a lot about how slavery went away and then you had Jim Crow and then which replaced slavery. And then the, um, you know, mass incarceration is now kind of has replaced Jim Crow. Right. And so uh, the systems that are in place 
are still working. They just change form uh, as we push against them. And so I was interested in that. And, and my relationship and my feelings as a light-skinned Black man to these issues and kind of, like I said, just processing through that stuff. So this is the, the most recent work I'm, I'm working on now. So the, the body of work will be called Piccanini 1976. And so a lot of my work um, has been really kind of focused on my black identity and, and, um, and I haven't really done a lot of work about my mother and my mother's experiences. And, and so when my mother's parents are, are from Mississippi, and my grandfather was in World War II, and so he had PTSD, uh, obvious, or obviously or not obviously, had PTSD. And so he left my grandmother with six kids so she could get on welfare. And so he moved back to Mississippi while my grandmother raised her kids in California. And so when he first met me, my mother relays this story that he said, where's that little picking in at? And so, this work is uh, is me. It's these old photos of me as a kid, <clears throat> and I'm thinking about this narrative of my grandfather saying, "Where's that Piccaninny at?" And I've been looking at that history of Piccaninny and that imagery, and so uh, especially in the Gulf regions, uh, the Gulf states, it's it's ubiquitous imagery of little black kids playing on the shore with a crocodile. And then the words gator bait, and, and these are kind of like racist postcards you can find in, in uh, antique stores still, but it was, it was imagery that was very ubiquitous at a certain time period. And so I'm interested in, in that violence to, you know, what, what that word implicates to black bodies. And it, it's, the implication is violence. The implication is erasure and, and the fact that uh, you know, my, my grandfather <laughs> uh, used that word to describe me. Um, I'm kind of, that's what I'm thinking about and that's what I'm working through. And, um, and so I've, I'm painting myself as a kid and I've inserted these crocodile heads ever so lovingly in each one of these paintings. Um, so that is that now. As I'm kind of researching and reading and, and reading about this story, you know, there's there's a kind of it's kind of half and half. Or it's there's a certain camp that says this never happened, it's there's not enough evidence that it happened, and there's another camp that says this this did happen, that little black children were used as gator bait. And um, and I, and so I don't think it matters if it happened or not, but I think for me, there's a there's a through line to that kind of humor, quote unquote humor, and this idea of uh, violence against black bodies. And you think of someone like Tamir Rice, you know, who was shot, and he he was fourteen, you know, twelve year old, twelve years old, and he was blown away by a cop very instantly, right? And so, I think the through line there is that that these kinds of this kind of imagery and that kind of humor allows for those things to happen uh, and is still relevant today as these things do happen so so that is what i'm working on currently and that's i think 20 minutes or 30 minutes Thank you, Michael. Um, so we, we have plenty of time for any comments or questions. Um, just sort of raise your hand if you'd like to ask something and we'll, we'll unmute. Can I ask a question? I can't find my, I don't know how to yeah, use this. Of course, this. no, no, no. I, mean, I, actually, I actually meant like actually raise yeah, your hand. hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Carolyn. Yeah, well, first of all, Michael, I really like this new work that you're doing. Um, you, 
you always surprise me with what's next. And this is really powerful stuff. Um, so thank you for sharing it. Um, wow. I had a question, but it's blown out of my, it's blown away right now. Um, so are you getting these photographs from your mom? Where are you getting these photographs that you're painting from? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I mean, so my, yes, my mother has handed me those photographs and said, here, you have them. I'm going to throw them away. So, so my sister got a bunch and I got a bunch. And so I, I have plenty of fo old photos that my mother didn't want to lug around anymore that now I now have uh, that I'm that I've pulled from to use for this imagery. And so could you say more about, you said you're thinking about finding your father again and how that might affect what you're doing right yeah. now. So, I mean, so this new work, I'm really thinking about it in three parts. And so this is kind of the first part. It's like three little mini stories. And so the Piccaninny 1976 is the first of that. And it, again, it's riffing off of this story about my grandfather. And I, I had all these photos around and I, I, I was at the... Um, Joan Mitchell Center this past summer at an artist residency. So I at an artist residency. So I just brought a bunch of those photos with me to see what would happen and you know see if anything stuck. Um, and so that's kind of that's get what got me thinking about this. Um, so so the the other two stories are going to be or the little mini series will be Miscegenation Nation, and so that'll really be me painting some portraits of my mother and. You know, I was born in 1976 and Loving versus Virginia was, you know, 67, 68. You know, my mother was this single white woman with a little black baby. And so I haven't really talked to her about her experiences of raising me um, and what that was like and how it was for her. And so I'm interested in that story. And so that'll be kind of the chapter two. And then the last chapter of these little three in the miniseries if you will, will be me. I'm going to find my biological father and um, meet him and then make some work about it. And so that's my plan. So, Thank you. Yeah. I think Graham uh, Elias or either Graham or Elias, either one. I don't know who was first. Elias, go ahead. Yeah, let's go with Elias. I'm going to unmute you, Elias. Elias, you're, oh. you're muted, Elias. Hold on one second. There you Can go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, loud and clear. Okay. I was very disturbed by the uh, black person, the black face with the red coming out of it, and you said it was a part of the performance art and stuff. It was like the black was eating up the white or the white was busting through the black, but either way, it was blood with the black which really sort of was a very disturbing image for me. Could mm -hmm. you spend a little time with that one? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and how that related to your teacher who had another one where the black was like in wax over her face or something. So, yeah, so Onye, so what happened was, is, is I, I was in graduate school at, at CU Boulder. Um, so Boulder, Colorado, it was my first semester there. And there was this project, I was, in, I was in a sculpture class and we were talking about the white cube and, and art, art that exists outside the white cube. So we had these maps that were in the white, the gallery space, and then that would lead you to artwork outside the gallery space. And so my, <laughs> so I made these six sambos and, and I, they were kind of different ethnicities, kind of like, it doesn't matter what brown you are, you're black. And it was said, welcome to Boulder, where there aren't many Mexicans, blacks, Asians, you know, and, and which is true. It was just a very, my response to Boulder, Colorado, when I first arrived there was like, where are where the brown people at? There's no brown people. And so, so it was kind of like tongue in cheek humor. It was funny to me. <laughs> and it was my response to being in that space. And I put it out in the main kind of thoroughfare of the university and I put it out like at three in the morning and then instantly um, in the morning, really early in the morning, some black students were walking, happened to see it, thought it was a hate crime. Cops were called, president of the college got involved. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> Channel 4 News was there. And so I'm sleeping at home. And then my professor's like calling, you know, there's like 25 <laughs> calls on my phone when I wake up. And, and they're like, dude, you got to come to the, the university now. And so I went there and there was this conference and there's like 200 people and and so i got up in front of the audience I had to explain the work people were yelling at me and they were all pissed off but what happened was is that these stories started coming out and one lady was like you know my kid goes to school across the street and they can't even walk over to the office without someone harassing them or saying something racial to them and then someone else stood up and then but ha so what happened was this, and, and I had just moved there, and there was, um, there was a lot of racial tension and problems there that I was unaware of because I had just moved there, but I was picking up on the fact that it was not a very diverse place. It was actually a very hostile place. And so, so Onye Zuzu, her kids went to that school where I had put it on, I had put it on the fence. She, mm -hmm. And so in that audience of 200 people, about half the people got it. And the other half didn't get it. And so Onye had, she thought it was funny. And so she got a hold of me and she was like, Hey, I'm thinking about, I'm doing some work that I'm developing. I would love to collaborate sometime. And so, and so essentially um, her, her makeup, her body makeup is not quite, it's not quite black. It's not blackface. Like you would think of like, it's a little bit different than the traditional blackface makeup, but it references that. Um, and what she was really interested in was the colors uh, that Alegua, and Alegua is this trickster figure in Ifa, which is an Afro-Caribbean religion that's from West Africa. It's like a mixture of Christianity and West African religion. And so Alegua is a trickster figure and he, he has one foot in the in one in the world of the dead and the one foot in the world of the living and so that becomes this metaphor for for the crossroads and so you know so that imagery was really about being at the crossroads of race being at the crossroads of black culture and white culture being um you know at the at the crossroads of the and having your foot in both of these worlds but not quite fully inhabiting both of them so it referenced Sambo, but it also referenced Alegua. And so, um, and the performance that she, she did was emotional and it was, you know, she channeled all of that stuff. So there was definitely lots of emotion coming out of her body with that performance. So it was, it was, would probably be, it was very, it's a beautiful, was a beautiful performance, but also very intense. So. Okay. That explains the red part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Graham, do you want to? Graham, do you want to ask? Sure. Uh, great talk, Michael. I really enjoyed getting to know your work better. Um, when you showed the paintings with the the alligators, I immediately knew the cultural reference, and I don't know whether it's because I've spent way too much time in antique stores in my you know forty seven years digging through the the postcard racks or it's because of our own postcard collection, formidable postcard collection here at the B Birmingham Museum of Art, which is accessioned as a single object that includes thousands and thousands of postcards, which I've only dug through a few times, but the one time I did dig through it, I was specifically looking for representations of uh, African Americans and found I, I can't say for sure where I, whether I found identical imagery to this, but I found a lot of similarly objectionable images. My mm -hmm. question for you is, was this, did you come to, to find this body of imagery through just research inquiry or did you stumble upon it and, and did it pique your interest? How did you find the, 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 the gator bait imagery to begin with? Uh, yeah. Intrigued by that. Yeah, I, I mean, I've known about it for a long time. I mean, the if you were to look on my bookshelves, you know, there it's it's you know uh, black culture, African American history, and 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 so it it's just it's a story that I I and my you know my dad lives in Florida. My Joe Dixon, my dad lives in Florida. Um, you know, so random antique, you know, 
going around to an antique stores, uh, seeing it, um, you know, even like Looney Tunes and Bugs Bunny cartoons and some of those things have some of that imagery embedded in it. So I think it, it's probably something that, that as I've read and researched and, and learned uh, about um, African-American history and culture, and, and then definitely researching this, this project with Oni Azuzu, really having to, to del you know, delve into minstrelsy and you know, that kind of history. It, it's just something that, has, that is in my purview in terms of what I'm reading and looking at. And then I've also seen it out in the world um, in various states and forms, so. museums. So. Thank you. Hey, Michael, yes. Gregory here. Can you, um, I want to talk a little bit or ask you to speak a little bit more to the politics of the work and the engagement of, of politics and, you know, this, this navigation you make between a kind of um, the personalist politics when you're sort of mining your personal story and history, and then when you sort of flip outside of yourself to examine and engage with um, other stories, mm -hmm. and, 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 and then have these, these, these moments of collision happen, like that moment, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I've known you a long time, and I've been around. And I, you know, that moment when something sparked in Boulder, right? When the kind of personal investigation collided and it became part of a civic dialogue. So it wasn't just you telling the story as an individual, mm -hmm. an individual engaging back out to the social political, but where you're, it's unfolding in a civic space mm -hmm. as you're creating it, as you're moving forward and thinking about it. And that's very, very different moment than you working in a kind of personal space yeah. telling a personal narrative yeah. you, you, you enter into a sort of a broader civic dialogue and i wonder if you can sort of speak to those different modalities and strategies yeah so i think that i'm always in the studio space it's always a personal space and i think that's the start that's always the beginning um I think I'm in, I'm interested in. I like it when when things collide, as you say. Like I, I like I like the work to be pretty or beautiful or attractive, and I like it that when the content is is hard, but the image is beautiful. I like that tension. So there's certain things in terms of composition, in terms of color palette, in terms of you know um, how I'm painting. There's more kind of formal things that are happening in the studio uh, that I'm really engaged with, and also thinking about personal this personal narrative. I think whenever you're whenever you're painting a black body, it's it's inherently political. Um, I understand. I think the other thing that I'm very much aware of and, and really interested in, in engaging with is anytime my work creates a conversation around race and identity, it's doing the work that I wanted to do. Um, I think that's what I'm interested in. I think that these are conversations that I have, you know, I live my life w through the lens of race. It's something I wake up with. It's something I go to bed with. It's my day to day. Um, but I understand that for a lot of people, uh, those conversations are difficult and they're, they're not conversations that people deal with on a regular basis. And I think that we should have those conversations often and frequent. And so there's some of that, um, some of that kind of po social political engagement that I can't control and that I don't necessarily want to control. And so sometimes it's a happy accident. Um, I think that I really, the other thing that I'm very much interested in is, is authenticity and, and being vulnerable. And, sh and I, and so I think that's what I have control of is, is putting it out there in a, in a vulnerable, authentic way as much as possible and, and true to my, who I am. 
and then I kind of let the cards fall where they may, you know, I, um, you know, like that, you know, like I, I, uh, the, the Sambo doll that I've painted, you know, I, I had a, a solo show in New York last spring and, a, and, you know, a black couple walked in, <laughs> they said, are you the artist? And I was like, yes. And they walked right out, you know, like they were, they were clearly upset and offended and not, you know, and, um, and I can't control that, you know? And so, so, so I think some of those things, I control the things that I can. And so some of those things I kind of, I'm, I'm okay with them playing out in a public sphere. And, and some of that stuff changes from region to region um, and venue to venue. Um, but ultimately, if I, can, if I can have people ask questions or, or talk or talk about race and identity, I think that's what I'm interested in. So. I, I want to push you a little bit here and see if you can um, sort of unpack a little bit more that difference when you made that gesture in Colorado Mm -hmm. And, you know, from a space of, a, of aware and not aware, right? You were new to the community. Yeah. And it sort of pushed your creative process out into an open space, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's mm -hmm. the studio spaces and, and the kind of model of only presented a finished work and the studio space mm -hmm. uh, means that, you know, it's all polished and packaged up mm -hmm. before it goes out mostly. And, and, and I think what I'm, what I'm wanting to engage your conversation with you around a little bit more is that those moments when you, you slipped or you stepped purposely out into the public space and the art still stays open. Um, and I, cause it did, it say it opened in a certain kind of way. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just wanted to know if you could, could I don't know, um, respond well, to that. I think, me. I mean, okay. So, I mean, I definitely think there's definitely, I mean, I have control of the imagery that I'm using, right? So I'm, when I, when I choose to pick up a black face Sambo doll, that's a, that's an intention. It's a loaded image. And so I know that, you know, there's already a lot of unpacking and, and um, there's, it's just, it's like a loaded gun. I mean, a, a black, a Sambo yeah. doll has, has a lot of baggage with it. And so in, in some of those instances, I'm being very, you know, yeah, I mean, those are intention, intentional choices right. um, that are going to have consequences, right? And so, and so, and the consequences, you know, my work is not work that most people are like, you know, that I love that painting. It, it matches the drapes. Like, I'm going to put that on the wall. <laughs> you know, that's not the kind of work I make. And so, yeah. uh, you know, so, the, you know, the work... Um, I, you know, I want it to, I want it to create tough conversations. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes, you know, and so, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm answering. That's that. great. That's great. Yeah. You know. <laughs> We're asking. Gail, Gail, Gail has a question. Gail, you're muted though. I think Gaynell also had a question. Um, yeah. Either way. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. All right. Um, um, first of all, oh, go, go ahead, Gaynell. No, 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 no. Go on. Right. No, um, I meant after you, Gail. After you. Oh, all right. Sorry, Michael. First of all, thank you. Really, really good, good talk, and I loved, I love seeing the images. I was interested if, um, if I couldn't help but notice the bluest eye in one of the titles, and then you mentioned Elizabeth Alexander's book, what literary references have been important to you in some of the paintings? Because they do, obviously, they 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 tell stories, they tell history. But are there are there books, both novels, fiction and nonfiction, that have been influential for you? Yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, you know, I'm, I mean, I. I read a lot of nonfiction, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately. No, that's not unfortunate. <laughs> so, uh, that's a result of graduate school. I haven't really picked pick up much nonfiction. But so, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly reading, uh, you know, uh, Bell Hooks is someone that I love that mm -hmm. I go to, I go back to quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, Beverly uh, Dan Daniel, B Beverly Tatum's, Beverly Daniel Tatum's uh, is, is someone that I go to, go back to a lot. Um, 
you know, I'd have to go, I'd have to cheat yeah. with my book. book right. okay. But those are two off the top of my head um, that are kind of in, you know, I'm constantly going back to mm -hmm. her. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm constantly picking up, you know, new books all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So these, you know, I've got a stack of books here that, <laughs> that I'm constantly reading, you know, and I listen to NPR all the time. So I'm constantly getting new books from NPR all the time. So, um, Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. You. And if, and if you want, I mean, if you want me, if you wanted me to generate a list, I could easily and would do so gladly. That would be great. I bet a lot of us would enjoy that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and, and, and Michael, if you can give me that list, I was, we can send it out to anyone that was here awesome. tonight. Awesome, yeah, I, I can do that for sure. Okay, uh, Gaynell had a question. Yeah. Um, thank you, Michael, for your presentation. It was great. I, um, I can relate to a lot of what you said. Elias and I have a small collection of black face artifacts and mm -hmm. objects. And initially for me, the collection was one that was um, disturbing. And mm -hmm. whenever I would see something, I would buy it or I would buy it so that it'd be one less piece out there for everyone else to see. Oh, yeah. and, but it evolved, it evolved yeah. into a teaching tool for, wow. for our children. And as you say, a conversation piece mm -hmm. for people who come to our home. So I can relate to uh, what you said about the dialogue that comes along with it, the conversation that comes along with it is, is more important sometimes than even the object itself. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for that. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Okay, uh, when have you spent? You said you had spent time in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Have you spent any time in Sub Saharan Africa and been confronted by the purity of that black experience? Um, I was in Cameroon most recently, but that's the only that's the only country I've been in uh, in, mm -hmm. uh, in Africa. But uh, it was lovely. Oh, that's close enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just wonder because it, it really had a profound effect on me and how I felt about my blackness. Sure. And I wondered if that's something that's had a chance to sort of sneak into your your um your your work because my my experience I, I shall never forget the thing that really sticks with me is that I was just talking, 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 and talking uh, in a group of Africans, and they stopped me and said, "But they're not here." And I, I was I didn't realize how consumed I was with black versus white mm -hmm. when I was surrounded. They said, well, what is it that you want to talk about or what is it that you want to do? Mm -hmm. And I never really had the freedom to think that way. So I wondered if that had happened to you and that you had really sort of soaked any of that in and been in, influencing your work. Yeah, well, I have lots of pictures from that trip that will definitely get painted at some point. I was, um, I also didn't fit in there either. So that was the big, <laughs> that was, my my <laughs> African moment, but it, they were like, go back home, white man. And I was like, oh, I'm yeah, not, I know. <laughs> I'm not I'm playing here either. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my experience. Well, they, 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 yeah, so they call me Mordine Blofonio, black yeah. white man. Yeah, yeah, so I understand yeah. that part of it, but it was, it, yeah. So yeah. I was there with students, and so some I had, I was there as a kind of chaperoning a class there, and we had some African American students, and they would just call everyone white, and the African American students were like, "What?" <laughs> they they were like mortified that that they were considered. <laughs> they were having a hard time with that. Oh yeah. Well, we're about out of time. Thank I think you. Michael, do, do do we want to take one more? Is there one more question? Or we can just yeah. I think I think maybe we'll just call it, Michael. That was fantastic. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Um, and like I said at the beginning, um, this isn't the last. We'll see if Michael Dixon in terms of Ava. Um, and so, if you didn't get to ask your question, I hope that once the world returns to some semblance of normalcy. Um, we'll be able to have Michael back in Birmingham and, um, and, and, and do this all over again. So thanks, Michael. You got it. Thanks, everyone.